episode four. Wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jim gave a reasonable description of Boo. Boo was about six and a half feet tall, judging from his tracks. He dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were bloodstained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long, jagged scar that ran across his face. What teeth he had were yellow and rotten. His eyes popped and he drooled most of the time. Let's try and make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jim said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill and Jim bet the gray ghost against two Tom Swifts that Jim wouldn't get any further than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jim had never declined a dare. Jim thought about it for three days. I suppose he loved honor more than his head, for Dill wore him down easily. You're scared, Dill said the first day. I ain't scared, just respectful, Jim said. The next day, Dill said, You're too scared even to put your big toe in the front yard. Jim said he reckoned he wasn't. He'd pass the Radley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him the third day when he told Jim that folks in Meridian certainly weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb, that he'd never seen such scaredy folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jim march to the corner where he stopped and leaned against the light pole, watching the gate hanging crazily on its homemade hinge. I hope you got it through your head that he'd kill each and every one of us, Dill Harris, said Jim when we joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it. Remember, you're still scared murmured Dill patiently. Jim wanted Dill to know once and for all that he wasn't scared of anything. It's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Besides, Jim had his little sister to think of. When he said that, I knew he was afraid. Jim had his little sister to think of the time I dared him to jump off the top of the house. If I got killed, what would become of you, he asked. Then he jumped, landed unhurt, and his sense of responsibility left him until confronted by the Radley place. You gonna run out on a dare, asked Dill. If you are, then, Dill, you have to think about these things, Jim said. Let me think a minute. It's sort of like making a turtle come out. How's that, asked Dill. Strike a match under him. I told Jim if he set fire to the Radley house, I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. I ain't hateful, just persuades him. It's not like you'd chunk him in the fire, Jim growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles don't fail, stupid, said Jim. Were you ever a turtle, huh? My stars, Dill. Now let me think. Reckon we can rock him. Jim stood in thought so long that Dill made a mild concession. I won't say you ran out on a dare, and I'll swap you the gray ghost if you just go up and touch the house. Jim brightened. Touch the house, that all? Dill nodded. Sure that's all now. I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all, said Dill. He'll probably come out after you when he sees you in the yard. Then Scout and me will jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't gonna hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Well, go on, said Dill. Scout and me's right behind you. I'm going, said Jim. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again studying the simple terrain as if deciding how best to effect an entry, frowning and scratching his head. Then 
I sneered at him. Jim threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm and ran back past us, not waiting to see if his foray was successful. Dill and I followed on his heels. Safely on our porch, panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick. But as we stared down the street, we thought we saw an inside shutter move. Flick! A tiny, almost invisible movement. And the house was still. Chapter 2 Dill left us early in September to return to Meridian. We saw him off on the five o'clock bus, and I was miserable without him until it occurred to me that I would be starting to school in a week. I never looked forward more to anything in my life. Hours of winter time had found me in the treehouse, looking over at the schoolyard, spying on multitudes of children through a two-power telescope Jem had given me, learning their games, following Jem's red jacket through wriggling circles of blind man's bluff, secretly sharing their misfortunes and minor victories. I longed to join them. Jim condescended to take me to school the first day, a job usually done by one's parents, but Atticus had said Jim would be delighted to show me where my room was. I think some money changed hands in this transaction, for as we trotted around the corner past the Radley place, I heard an unfamiliar jingle in Jim's pockets. When we slowed to a walk at the edge of the schoolyard, Jim was careful to explain that during school hours I was not to bother him. I was not to approach him with requests to enact a chapter of Tarzan and the Ant-Men, to embarrass him with references to his private life or tag along behind him at recess and noon. I was to stick with the first grade and he would stick with the fifth. In short, I was to leave him alone. You mean we can't play anymore? I asked. We'll do like we always do at home, he said. But you'll see, school's different. It certainly was. Before the first morning was over, Miss Caroline Fisher, our teacher, hauled me up to the front of the room and patted the palm of my hand with the ruler, then made me stand in the corner until noon. Miss Caroline was no more than 21. She had bright auburn hair, pink cheeks, and wore crimson fingernail polish. She also wore high-heeled pumps and a red and white striped dress. She looked and smelled like a peppermint drop. She boarded across the street one door down from us in Miss Maudie Atkinson's upstairs front room. And when Miss Maudie introduced us to her, Jem was in a haze for days. <laughs> Miss Caroline printed her name on the blackboard and says, This says I am Miss Caroline Fisher. I am from North Alabama, from Winston County. The class murmured apprehensively, should she prove to harbor her share of the peculiarities indigenous to that region. When Alabama seceded from the Union on January 11, 1861, Winston County seceded from Alabama, and every child in Macomb County knew it. North Alabama was full of liquor interests, big mules, steel companies, Republicans, professors, and other persons of no background. Miss Caroline began the day by reading us a story about cats. The cats had long conversations with one another. They wore cunning little clothes and lived in a warm house beneath the kitchen stove. By the time Mrs. Cat called the drugstore for an order of chocolate malted mice, the class was wriggling like a bucket full of Catawba worms. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the ragged, denim-shirted, and flower-sack-skirted first grade, most of whom had chopped cotton and fed hogs from the time they were able to walk, were immune to imaginative literature. Miss Caroline came to the end of the story and said, Oh, my, wasn't that nice? 
Then she went to the blackboard and printed the alphabet in enormous square capitals, turned to the class and asked, does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of the first grade had failed it last year.